MLB draft is already pretty hard, and colleges seem to be making it harder. So we're going to discuss that today with good friend of the show, Jeff Potts from Baseball America. You are Locked On Guardians, your daily podcast on the Cleveland Guardians. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's show. Today's show is brought to you by eBay Motors. From brakes to exhaust kits and beyond, eBay Motors has over 122 million parts to keep your ride or die alive. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to bring home that big win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusion supply. eBay guaranteed fit. Only available to U.S. customers. I want to thank you for making us your first listen today and every day, wherever it is you get podcasts. I am Jeff Ellis, one of the hosts of Locked On Guardians, one of the original hosts on the MLB network for Locked On. Uh, before this, I was a national writer at Scout and 24-7 about pros- prospects in the draft, as well as your fifth favorite writer at every Cleveland baseball blog over the last decade. Justin Latta, I'm also one of your co-hosts here. We're happy to have you Come to the right place for your daily fix of Cleveland Guardians content. I've been covering the Guardians minor league system since 2007. Former writer of Guardians Baseball Insider and freelancer at the Morning Journal and the News Herald for 10 years now, surprisingly. And also I've done some stuff at Prospects Live, which is where we met today's guest, Jeff Ponce, who's now at Baseball America, who doesn't need a whole introduction because he's already fantastic. And he's been on the show before, and he was one of uh, our listeners' favorite guests, I would that's not a, a reach at all. I think we were told that. So, uh, awesome. Jeff, thanks for coming back on, especially right now with uh, the t- college tournament going on. And uh, things are, are super weird in college baseball this year. Not just this year, though. Yeah. Last couple of years, it seems like uh, things have been uh, trending into a juice ball sort of steroid era kind of environment just in terms of the run production. Uh, not that the balls are juiced or there are steroids. I don't know any of those sort of things necessarily. But uh yeah, it's been uh, it's been an interesting one for sure. But uh, happy to be back on the show, chat with you guys. Yeah, I enjoyed your article. That's what I really want to talk about too. Was for Baseball America how MLB teams and draft analysts are navigating tricky college baseball run environments. So there's been a lot of stuff floating around. You know, people are putting on Twitter out there or X, whatever we're calling it these days, about the run environment and and if the bats are hot, if the balls are juiced, you know, whatever. But this is not like hearsay. This is not just people speculating. Like there seems to be legitimate like people in baseball. You you've talked to people and uh, the article suggests that teams are aware that there is something they have to account for here. That's not just every day. Like teams aren't all sudden players aren't all sudden better hitting home runs at the way they are. Yeah. Um, you know, last year they set the record. If you're looking at it in a home run per game basis at 1.14 home runs per game, uh, it was averaging 1.16 going into the weekend know how much those games might have shifted that i don't think it probably based on the amount of home runs we saw necessarily would have been a uh, a negative impact uh on that number and it's just been sort of climbing uh over the last three years really um but heavily in the last three years it's kind of steadily climbed since the initial um switch to bb core bats back in i think it was 2012 where there was a, a dip and and the run environment is kind of steadily, you know, improved in terms of home runs and runs per game. Um, I think some of it you could probably say is better bat technology uh, over that period in time. I think hitters have started to train differently. You know, baseball athletes have started to train differently. So there isn't some, inspect, I think, expected improvement from sort of that immediate shut off from the drop five era. Um, But now what we're seeing is we're seeing home run environments that are exactly, if not worse than the drop five era, uh, even at their highest point. So it's it's kind of remarkable how we've we've come full spectrum in college baseball. And we're we're sort of back to this crazy home run environment. But we have a lot more metrics and ways to measure that performance than we've ever had before. I'm just glad teams are actually taking this into account, like. Like I said in, in the open, like drafting is already hard enough as it is. And I know you just went through a podcast on the 90th percentile about college hitters who did not yeah. work out. And yeah, this is already difficult enough because those guys that you talked about on there were quote unquote safe or whatever you want to call it. Nobody's really safe, but now teams have to account for this. But you seem to feel like, you know, a lot of teams are 
taking this into account. They are doing something because they have to, because clearly this is this is an issue they cannot let go unignored, whether it's models or whether it's like, you know, just their their evaluations going into the draft. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, what we've seen is teams are really just, they've already sort of figured out how to adjust performance across different conferences, how different part factors play into the numbers so they can adjust for all that stuff as well. Um, and now they have, you know, EVs, obviously a multitude of batted ball related metrics, um, you know, whether that's sort of rate metrics uh, with contact and in-zone contact, chase rates, you know, breaking that sort of data down by pre-two strike counts and post-two strike counts. Um, of course, you know, the quality of contact metrics beyond just the EVs, which is almost like the velocity. You know, we kind of with fastballs or, you know, uh, pitches, we look at the velocity, we also look at the movement. And I think that's the thing is we're seeing a lot of EVs, but it's also – what are the batted ball angles? How well do they elevate? Do they elevate to their pull side? You know, all those sort of things. Um, but I think generally what they're they're figuring out is with all those metrics, you know, they're expected statistics um, based on EVs, based on launch angles. They're kind of able to account for some of the juice balls or the ju juice bat concerns, definitely for the juice balls more so than that. And we don't know that there are juice balls in college baseball. We just think there probably are. And I think just based on our experience as Major League Baseball fans, it's something that's pretty familiar and kind of front of mind when we see a home run spike. There's something else going on. Where it's the balls, obviously, as I said earlier, we have the steroid era. Um, so there's some of that stuff, I think, at play as well. But teams do have so many metrics. They have the ability to adjust for so many things that it seems like maybe they're getting away from sort of some of those statistical markers that you had always heard about like 20 home runs in a major conference or, you know, somebody that hits 360 or whatever. And, you know, now we're, we're, we're kind of getting a little bit deeper into it and saying, you know, maybe those numbers don't matter as much. I think on the EV side, it's the same. Like it's great when a college account tweets out, Oh, you know, uh, Jack Caglianone hit a ball 119 miles an hour. Great. But that's not 119 miles an hour in the major leagues. Uh, you, you know what I mean? Like, he's not going to see yes. what he's probably seeing there, et cetera. He still hits the ball really hard. So when a major league team is looking at it and they're analyzing these players, looking at it more like, all right, well, that's still the 99th percentile in terms of EVs. It doesn't matter that it's a 119. That's probably smoke. He's probably not Giancarlo Stanton or Aaron Judge or, you know, one of those kind of guys. Um, but he is probably somebody with – 70 power um and i think you can kind of say say the same thing with like cond and some of those guys uh so there's a way for them to account for it um i just think it's not one for one with maybe the metrics and numbers that we're familiar with in pro ball because that's where we get the largest amount of data from and it's a wood bat it's major league players you know so we can't necessarily go one for one when a guy hits a ball 119 we could probably say, yeah, he's probably hitting balls 114, 115 easy with a, with a wood bat. Like the power's there, no question. But it's really where he scales against the rest of the college player pool. No, that, that all makes so much sense. As, you know, I think at one point this year, I was counting up to 20 home run records broken, and there's just so much weirdness. So it's, it's great to see, to hear the perspective and get like, in depth and understanding that you're uh, providing. So thank you for for that. Um, Justin, what was your next question going to be? I was going to ask you too. Like there were some, there was uh, Josh Nash had tweeted this a couple of weeks ago about um, just different factors going in, into college baseball. Uh, this is a former coach from Cleveland, actually, and just talking about like COVID uh, pushing guys to, to school necessarily, but uh, like he had put out like, teams with sub four ERAs this year, like college pitching has gotten worse. Like there was only seven and this was as of like late May. Um, but you've got more teams with over 300 batting averages than ever before. Uh, at the time he tweeted this, there was 25 teams with over a hundred home run or hundred teams with 25 home runs in division one and more walks allowed. And some of it was, you know, the juice bats, the, the hot or juice balls, hot bats, 
but also Trackman shrinking umpire strike zones is one of his points. And then just college pitching across the board, just being diminished. Do you think that how much of a factor is pitching in this? Did you hear anything about that necessarily? Yeah, I think that's where the biggest question marks are actually at. And I'll have another article coming out later this week, uh, kind of going into the pitching side. Um, it feels like teams are looking at it from a few different ways. Um, the college run environment's so crazy. We're seeing guys that pitched really poorly or had low, uh, or excuse me, um, high ERAs and power conferences coming into pro ball and then shoving and performing better than they did uh, in those college conferences. I think if you watch a lot of these games and follow anybody that's kind of analytically inclined in the college game, there's a lot of like really high quality pitches that are getting hit that don't necessarily get hit in pro ball. Um, and I think it's led teams to be more and more conscientious of what's the quality of stuff. And, you know, I think this is the other kind of undiscussed part of drafting is, and I use the analogy of a chef. If you have a great French chef, you don't go and buy ingredients for him to make tacos, right? Or Connie Asada. You're going to have him make a, a French dish, right? You're going to grab him those ingredients. And player development isn't universal in the sense that they're not, not every team's player development does everything well. And not every team's player development is the right fit for every player. And I think the teams that do the best, the Orioles, you know, we're seeing it with the Mariners, we're seeing it with the Dodgers. The teams that do the best with this are the ones that identify the traits that their player development does the best job of sort of accentuating. And that's, probably played out even more so on the pitching side because I think just so much more development with pitching happens at the pro level than what happens at colleges and particularly SEC schools where there is a certain barometer for performance and you don't really have time to figure it out. If you're in Florida's rotation, and we've seen some guys that couldn't crack Florida's rotation be better starters than guys that were in Florida's rotation. Christian Scott is one of them. Brendan Sprode is another one of the Mets that's moving up right now. Who I mean, obviously cracked it later in his career. But I think you kind of look at it as like, I don't know if college performance matters all that much because there's guys who are sort of like a Kurt Holton. I don't really want that guy in pro ball. I'm not all that excited about him. But like, he's been a good performer for Vandy, right? Like at, right, right out the gate as a freshman. And there's a lot of guys who are good college performers that aren't necessarily good pro prospects and sometimes they get they get hyped up um michael mcgreevy is kind of one of those you know where he's a guy even when the cardinals need pitching they don't call him mcgreevy he's in triple a still pitching i think he's had probably like 160 career triple a innings or something like that um so i think that there's some teams that just throw it out entirely and one is the mariners i think you look at the mariners they don't care about college performance as much. They care about strikes and they care about pitch shapes and the qualities that they can accentuate. The perfect example is Logan Evans. Throughout this process, I asked some questions about on the pro side as well, but the consistent thing that came up from four or five teams, a few playoff teams, very high budget teams with big payrolls that spend a lot of money. Um, Logan Evans was a guy that didn't get turned in by a lot of teams. And now this guy's shoving in double A they did kind of a similar thing with Bryce Miller. Brian Wu was another one. And it's because they can identify traits and they're not concerned as much with performance. I think even Tanner Bybee with, with you folks is sort of the same deal. Where Bybee's numbers weren't great in college at the end. And then, you know, figured some things out. And, you know, some of it was maybe not being around the college coaching and the demands of throwing a ton of innings all the time and kind of wearing it and not doing what's best for your development, but what's best for the team winning. And I think that's something that people can't separate all the time with college baseball is there is much more importance in terms of winning games at the college level um, than there is in the minors. It's not about development. You don't see that level of like um, uh, focus on the W until you get to the majors. Yeah. I'm glad you said that St statistics don't always matter. And, college and pros are is, is at odds with development and winning we'll get into more of that coming up on the other side for the rest of today's show stick around 
So tomorrow, the Guardians are back in action against the Royals. I was checking the over-under on FanDuel. The over-under right now is eight on Tuesday, and it's Seth Lugo versus Tristan McKenzie. Uh, Tristan McKenzie's given up five home runs his last two starts. Seth Lugo has only given up two earned runs his last couple starts. So that's going to be tricky to balance. I'm going to go ahead and say that uh, you could probably pick the under. The Royals' offense is pretty good, though. But the Guardians' bullpen is pretty good, so that's going to be really tricky. I would check back for that one. I'm not going to give a clear answer there, but I will say check Seth Lugo's over/under on strikeouts. He's only struck out eight guys the last 13 innings. Guardians do not strike out a lot, so check the over/under on that one. Let's see where that goes. I would definitely bet on Tristan McKenzie giving up a home run based on the way things have gone lately. And Bobby Witt and Salvador Perez have been the kind of guys that will attack his fastball uh, when it's not good. So I would definitely check on that on Fanduel for Tuesday's game, and it is winner. Take all time in the NBA and the NHL, and FanDuel is giving you a shot to bring home a big win of your own. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. So just take any $5 bet, even if the odds are, are just so you know not great. You're not going to get a huge payout, but if you think the bet is, is going to cash, you're a new customer. Put the 5 bucks down, and you'll get 150 bucks to bet on spreads, money lines, player props, like we talked about more. Visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn to make every playoff shot count. Vandal, America's number one sports book. And you can catch the first pitch of that action on Tuesday. Tristan McKenzie and Seth Lugo at 610 by searching Guardians on your Sirius XM app. Um, the last piece, too, in your article, Jeff, and again, I don't want I want people to go read this at Baseball America because I've been waiting all year for someone to write this piece because we've been talking about it all year on the show. Like something is not right, like something's happening here. And and teams are aware of it. And the last thing you, you talked about there, and you were just talking about before the break, not just necessarily stats, but comparing guys to their peers. Like you said, 118 x velocity, that's great. But where does that rank in terms of his peers? And, and is there like a law of diminishing returns on that? Like, you know, at some point, it doesn't really matter if you go above like 112 or whatever. But um, at the end of the day, you can only draft among the group you have available. Like you, you have to pick who's in your player pool that year. So, I think ranking these guys against each other is really where it comes down to. And that's why I thought that piece was really good. Like you have to evaluate these guys against their playing field. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, they have enough numbers. Um, they have a big enough sample size now that they can break down a lot of these guys and pick holes and pick nits, um, you know, to an, to an extreme. And I can tell you that that's exactly what goes on, you know, in these processes where, they really beat the crap out of these guys. They're going to spend this amount of money on top of the draft looking for potential warts. Um, and I think the smart teams, you know, they, they do their due diligence, you know, they're not going to just take stuff at face value. Um, and I think, you know, we do have some college hitters at the top of the draft that have interesting numbers, interesting performance um, and kind of all different backgrounds too. So that being said, the last time you were on, we talked a lot about Travis Bazana because you know Travis very well. Um, has your opinion at all changed on the one-one pick? I mean, you know, the, the podcast you were just doing uh, the, on uh, 90 percentile, you were talking about college hitters haven't worked out as well as you might think. This is not a great high school class, as it seems. So, um, you know, Cleveland's been connected to Connor Griffin. They've been connected to Bazana. They've been connected to Con, and they're going to be connected to everybody at this point. That's that's how the yeah, the cycle works. But has have has thing have things changed for you? I know if you were Cleveland, I'm assuming you're still taking Bazana. Yeah, I'm still I'm still a Bazana guy. Um, you know, I just think that the makeup of the kid, um, the performance over three years at Oregon State, um, coming over here and kind of you know taking the chance and making the commitment to to himself. He raked in the West Coast League. He had you know an all time I think top twenty five kind of Cape run this year as well. Um, you'd be hard pressed to find a guy that I think is more ready to be a star and a leader. And he does so many things well on the field. Um, I know my colleague Carlos disagrees with this one, but I, uh, I think he's, I think he could play center. I think this is a guy that has the speed. He has the athleticism. Um, he's a pretty good second baseman. You want him to move him to, to center field because you think that's a better fit for the team. I think that's fine. Um, I just think this is a guy that you want in your organization. And I, I think that even in comparison to other college hitters, I think the bust rate's a little bit lower. 
and he comes from a different system. I mean, this guy doesn't come from what we always say in the 90th percentile, me and Matt Pajak, the exposure funnel. Like he's not a USA national U15 guy that was at all the PG tournaments at 13, 14, 15 years old. He doesn't, you know, you know, I hate saying this because I'm American, but it, it does feel like the big issue that I, I run into. And I heard this a few years ago from a very experienced scout. And it's, I think that American players have gotten soft and I, I sound really old when I say that, <laughs> but, but, but I, I do think like how they're handled and you don't get the same kind of baseball rats that you used to get. Right. And I think that there was like a certain ability to deal with adversity that, you don't see as much. I think we see it a lot on the pitching side with guys that just, they don't throw many pitches. They bang out of their high school tournaments before they start because they want to, they want to rest their arm before the draft, you know, um, Brendan Barriera did that. Right. I mean, he, he banged out mm -hmm. of, a, 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 you know, a cavalry Christian team that was absolutely loaded and probably could have won the state title. Right. I mean, we haven't seen guys do that. Bazzano doesn't come from that background. This dude came from Australia. This dude had to grind to get here. He had to be the best player in a continent, you know, um, that isn't baseball crazy. And, you know, he wants to be here. He wants to be a big leaguer. And that's not to say that anything about Charlie Condon or, or, or others that might be in this mix. Um, I think if you're going hitter here, you're going college hitter, because it is a bad high school class. There's just, there's no option at one from the high school class. I, I, I don't think you'd you'd underslot Connor Griffin here personally. Um, so I think it's either this you or you're really into Hagen Smith or Chase Burns. Like, you know, it's either one of the pitchers or it's Bazana for me. Um, I understand the, the the Condon side of things, but it's a high level college hitter. First baseman does not have the track record that Bazana has. Um, and Bazana set every record, like every offensive record at Oregon State. And you can go back and look at some of the big leaguers that have played at Oregon State in the last 15 years. Um, and, you know, pound for pound, his performance has been better than all those. Heightened college run environment, all that sort of thing. Um, but I just, I, I think this should be the 1-1 one -one in the draft. I don't think he's done anything to dissuade me uh, from, from having him 1-1. One -one. Um, We'll see. We'll see where the money shakes out because it's it's Major League Baseball draft. The best player doesn't always go. And I think some people can make a case that Charlie Condon's the best player. I mean, he's had a all-time sort of college season. Um, there's no way to, to get around that. But I think you look at how Bazana's performance has improved in all parts of his game year after year. He added power, and he's now a power hitter, and he did that without sacrificing – his approach and his bat to ball skills. He's a really smart hitter and he's a leader. I mean, I, I think you saw it at Oregon state. You see it. Saw it I saw it in the Cape firsthand. He makes guys around him better and he makes guys around him want to play harder. Like he's just one of those guys. And I think he's going to be a bad mix for a bunch of guys that don't want to play hard. And he's going to be a great mix for a bunch of guys that love baseball and want to win ball games. Cause that's what he's going to do. That sounds like somebody else in the Guardians. I don't make that comparison. I'll throw that out there when we get back, and we'll see if anybody else agrees. Also, a couple of guys in the Guardian system got promoted. We're going to chat about that a little bit as we wrap up today's episode. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over, with over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you, you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit. Only available to U.S. customers. Big showdown for the Guardians? We'll see if it's a big showdown, really. It might just it's be a big like showdown. <laughs> it's a big showdown. It's Second one versus two. Royals. That's always big. Yeah, one versus two. That game, that series starts on Tuesday at 6 10. 
catch all the action on your Sirius M- XM app. Just search Guardians, whether in your car, your computer, your phone, you can find all that good stuff. So Travis Bazana, just the, the way you're describing him in terms of like not, you know, not a good fit for guys who don't want to play hard and a uh, fit for guys who want to play their tails off. That sounds like Jose Ramirez. And I hate when people make comps to Jose Ramirez like that because, you know, those players that we were talking on yesterday's show about, he's a unicorn. Guys just don't do what he does. He's only five foot nine and yeah. all the other good stuff we've talked about in the past. But that's the kind of makeup, the mentality he has. And, you know, you don't often get to say this about the draft when a guy could be up a year later. It's It's been that way a little more lately, but a good chance that you could pair Travis Pisana with Jose Ramirez now. And though, I don't know that to me, maybe I'm crazy. I don't know. Either one of you, Jeffs, if you disagree with me on that, that, that just sounds like a, a very similar comparison there to me. Yeah. Um, you know, and certainly adding the impact of Charlie Condon would be great, but you just went out and traded for a first baseman and <laughs> he's supposed Where to be the that? future there. Right. I mean, I don't know. Like I, I, I guess the positional stuff for me at the major league level, even like doesn't come into the, the equation because that stuff works itself out. Yeah. I just, <laughs> You know, you, you talk about risk versus reward and all that situation. And we know that Cleveland does value that type of work ethic. And we know that just on the team, it is one of those things they value. And I think, not, again, you know, not just to, to knock anyone else, but it is just uh, very clear that one player is on a, a whole different level. And Cleveland ha- has to get this right, too. Like, they can't afford to get this wrong. Like, you're not, you know, they had never picked one, one before and not again, not no players quote unquote safe, but you know, you take the wrong pick here and, and you may not have a chance. And I guess maybe you will have a chance if you screw it up because you could be looking at odds again to be at the top of the draft, but I don't know. Is, do you think there's a wrong pick between Condon or Bazana is, you know, you said you wouldn't under slot Griffin here. You know, I see people saying, well, Weatherhold's playing a good shortstop during the tournament, all that stuff. Like I think there is a, good, a wrong pick here, but. I think I think Weatherholt's the dark horse here, um, and I honestly don't think any of those three would be a bad pick. I don't think Hagen Smith would be a bad pick. I think the high school players would be a bad pick. I I, I think Connor Griffin, um, as exciting and tooled up as he is, there's some questions about how much he's going to hit against quality stuff. Um, you know, I had somebody put it to me as like, he, you either think he's going to be a superstar or you think he's Bubba Starlight. And that's a little scary, wow. right? Um, so, and that was from a high level cross checker. So, like, that wasn't from somebody that just like, talks out their butt either. Um, yeah. And he got a good look, like a good look at Connor Griffin. Um, but that's kind of where the industry is. I think it's very split uh, on him. And uh, yeah, you know, I think. It's the top of the draft here. There's some interesting college hitters. There's some interesting college pitchers. And that's just the nature of where we're at. And the reason that people think it's a bad draft is because the high school class isn't good. And that's what really boosts up a lot of draft class. When you go back and look five, six years in the future, you say, all right, well, look at all these guys that went in late first, the guys that went in the second that signed for overslap bonuses. You know, James Woods, one of the top prospects in baseball right now and was a second rounder, like, you know, Gunnar Henderson's one of the top players in baseball right now. He's a second rounder. Like, you know, it's that high school depth is kind of what the issue is. And so it's not the best year to underslot. I think you got to pick your guy, decide who you're going to hang your hat on, go there and see who's around in a second, you know, um, because it's not. Yeah, what are you saving your money for? Right. Like, that's that's the point. That's what, kind are, of it, what are you, you know? saving the money for? Yeah. You yeah I'll be curious to see. Board. Yeah, I guess we'll see how interesting that uh, should, should we be valuing college pitching more like not necessarily the guys that aren't as good, but like Jeff has mentioned this multiple times in the show about, you know, Burns and, and Smith have been so good this year in this highly charged offensive environment. Like, does that give them a little more yeah. more feathers in their cap, you think? Yeah, maybe. And I think uh, Trey Yasevich, uh, Yasevich is as well. Um I think it's right there in that conversation. He's pitched really, really well. I think from like a command and like a deep arsenal of pitches, like pitchability side, like he might be better than the other two. The other two just have louder stuff and have had the strikeout numbers and all that sort of thing, but they carry more relief and injury risk. I think than 
than Yesovich does as long as he stays away from acupuncture. It's <laughs> also why I kind of like Prager. Like I, I know he's not like in that tier, but just the overall performance he's, and command. I, I feel like he's he's not as far off as maybe other people. He's a late first round guy. Like because I had a conversation with those two guys, Yesovich and then Prager is kind of like guys that have performance and like some stuff. Like his stuff's not on the same tier as the top two and behind Yesovich as well. Um, I really, I actually really like Trey Yesovich that I think whoever ends up with him is going to end up with one of the better players in the draft. Real quickly before we get out of here, because we were short on time, but we did want to mention that uh, CJ Kavis is going to Akron. Nate Furman's going to Akron. A couple of promotions. Angel now is going to Lake County. So that's exciting. You got to see Kavis a little bit. You said Furman a little bit less so on the Cape, but uh, in about, you know, two minutes here or a minute, what do you, what do you remember about their performance on the Cape? Yeah. I mean, both, both hit tool guys, really high level plate skills, contact and approach is, is, is really good. Um, Capus has just, I think, started to hit for a little bit more impact. I mean, it's still like not crazy juice or anything like that, but um, yeah, I think, you know, Capus has always been able to hit and there's kind of always been a little bit more like power projection maybe in there um, than people realized. And, I think just generally like any players that get out of Miami tend to flourish. <laughs> Interesting. He has pulled the ball in the air more. I will say I've noticed this year. So that's a good start for a guy who, if you're going to try to maximize power, you better do it that way. If you don't have, you know, 55, 60 grade power. Yeah. The EVs aren't, aren't great, but um, yeah, you know, in terms of the bat to ball skills, like he really misses in zone really low. You know, in zone miss rates, low chase rates. Um, he's putting the ball in the air a lot. But, yeah, the EVs are, you know, it's like a 102 90th percentile. So kind of below average. Yeah. Take what you can get in the air and see where it ends up. Yeah, I think he's a guy that if he adds, you know, a little bit more strength, um, the EVs get up to like 103.5, 104. With that profile, it would be pretty exciting. And that's that's possible. I think he could get there. Jeff, thanks for coming on with us today. Again, go to Baseball America, read how MLB teams, draft analysts are navigating tricky college baseball run environment. There's going to be a pitching one later out this week, he said. So uh, please go support their work because they help us a lot on the podcast, just reading their stuff and, and having all that available, whether it's draft or prospect content. I know I'm I'm constantly on there just looking for angles, and this is the article I've been waiting for all year. Appreciate it, man. Uh, and we want to – quickly thank each and every one of you for joining us uh shout out to go throw some uh itunes reviews are always very helpful so uh go and throw some of those up thank you to each and every one of our everydayers and thank you again to jeff for joining us and go go guardians go